Now, those of you who have chosen to spend this holiday day with us today, with the Lord, I'm really glad, and I want to seize this moment of opportunity, breaking away from our sermon series and just talk to you about this transition that you're going through right now with back to school. If you have your Bibles this morning, you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is in the Old Testament, the fifth book. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a retelling of the Pentateuch, the first four books. And in here, Moses tells the story again. And if you also will look back to chapter 5, we'll be referring to chapter 5, but I want to read from chapter 6. <clears throat> I'm reading from the New International Version, and we're going to pick up in verse 4. And the context here is that God is speaking from Mount Sinai. He has just given the Ten Commandments. The word of the Lord has come to the people. This is how I want you to live your lives. And then, in the middle of this, God breaks out and speaks and says, here's how I want you to raise your families. And I want to talk to you about that this morning, about what the Bible says about raising our families. And it begins in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You know, Jesus was once asked, what is the greatest of all the commandments? Because there were 600 plus commandments. And Jesus, without hesitation, said, it's this one. And he quoted the Shema, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And then it says, verse 6, these commandments that I give you today, what commandments? Well, he had just given the Ten Commandments, the greatest of which is the One Commandment. And now he says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your what? Hearts. And then he says this, verse 7, impress them. Now that Greek word for impress there was the king had a, uh, would have a ring and he would put a, a wax seal on a letter. He would take his ring off and he would impress it on there to put his seal on. His authority was on that. That's the Greek word, the Greek word in the Septuagint that is used here. And, and it says, I want you to impress. I want you to push, okay? I want you to enforce. I want you to be intentional about this. That you impress these on your children. How do I do that? Talk about them when you sit at home. And when you walk, walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now let's just uh, skip down to verse 20. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you, tell him this. We were once slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord set signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors." The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God. Why? So that we might always do what? Prosper and be kept alive as it is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this, all this law before the Lord our God as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. And righteousness is our favor with God. Father, thank you for this, this short and simple but very important word today. I pray that we will put it on our hearts 
just as you told us to. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is the week where the kids go back to school, right? It's like uh, the little yellow bus comes and swallows them up, takes them away. And we stand there, and you have a response. Most parents this, this week are doing this. <laughs> Happy dance, right? All excited, yes! I've had the kids all summer, all day. Sarnar. And they're doing the happy dance. Some of us are, some of you are crying because maybe it's the first time and your child has just become a kindergarten and now they're going off to school for the first time and wave goodbye at the window and the tears are coming down your face and it's, it's, it's like a new step in their life, and you're excited, but you're scared, and you got all these emotions going on inside of you. And some of you are grandparents. You're crying, and you're sad because you know you're not going to get to see the grandkids as much as you did over the summer, and now you're just going to see them maybe on the weekends, and etc. There's a lot of emotions. This has been an emotional week for Linda and I as well because... Uh, uh, this is a, a first for us this year. And, you know, I've been looking on Facebook and social media and Instagram, and I've seen all your pictures you've been posting up there, you know, of your kids standing out in front of the house and the front door, you know, first day of kindergarten, uh, going to junior high school, eighth grade, and you're posting these pictures. So Linda and I have our own picture that we want to post, and I'm going to bring it forth for the first time this morning. And here it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you can't read it, it says, empty nests, 34 years. <laughs> we have had a child in our house for 34 years. That's why my hair is gone. <laughs> you thought it was you. 34 years. Think about that. That's a long time. Some of you became empty nesters 15 years ago. And we decided to have more children 15 years. But anyway, so we're celebrating. It's like the last, we are not doing a picture with kids this year. Hallelujah. So we're doing the happy dance. And we're very excited to enter into this new phase in our life. <laughs> uh, but I want to capitalize on this moment to instill some scriptural truths into your life that I feel are really critical for Christian families. You know, we have a lot of young families at Lighthouse Church, and I want to help you to be the godly parents that God has called you to be. Because I am under the conviction that the best way to bring about change in our nation is not by politics. I believe that the best way to bring about change is to produce and strengthen Christian marriages and families. Because as the home goes, so goes the nation. The real root of the problems that we have, and I'm only speaking of our culture and our nation in America, is not finances or immigration or education or social security. The real problem, the root of all of these problems is simply this, the deterioration and the destruction of the family unit. That's a place to say amen. Amen. Marriage and fidelity have been undermined, divorce encouraged, children are insecure, move from parent to parent, home to home, school to school, families don't place God and church as a priority in their life, they attend church when they feel like it, they don't pray together, they read, don't read scriptures together. They don't even sit down at a meal together. Things are radically changing. You know, I was sitting at, uh, with my wife at Cracker Barrel about a month ago, and this 
this big family came in, they had like five kids, and we're like, oh, look at that family, it's so cool, you know, all these children, and the father still has his hair, and it was like, whoa, and a nice looking family, and they sat down right beside us over here, so we were like watching them, and they weren't at that table for like 60 seconds, before the hostess even got there, and everybody pulled out their phones, and they were all sitting like this. All their heads were down. The whole time they were there, they never talked. They never made jokes. They never had a food fight. They didn't even look at their food. They were just looking at their phones. You know, we have a rule in our house. Mealtime, whenever you come to the table, no cell phones, right? <laughs> That's a good rule for you to incorporate in your family. Are you a Cracker Barrel family or are you a Lavender family, <laughs> right? So... But that's just a sign of kind of the changes in where we are that reflects the difficulties that we're having. And I also understand that the times that you're raising your children, especially those of you who have little ones, you know, is very different than the time when I raised my children, our three boys. Because, uh, you know, when my older boys were younger, I mean, they came home from school, and then if they had they finish their homework, and then they go out to play. They go outside to get in their bikes, ride around the neighborhood. I didn't have a clue where they were. Wasn't worried about them. I knew they would be back in when it started to turn dark. And parents watched out for each other's kids. But I wasn't worried about sickos or psychos out there. Now you can't even, you can't even let your kids play in the yard, it seems like. If somebody's walking by, you're worried about them going to shoot my kid. So, I mean, it's just, the, the planet has radically changed. My kid's school was a safe place. Sports, after school activities were encouraged by everyone. You know, my boys bought, brought weapons to school. They had pocket knives, recess, they would play, they'd get their knives out, they'd go... Pop, 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 pop. Somebody know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one here? <laughs> yeah. Nobody, you know, uh, show and tell up in northern Wisconsin, show and tell, Matt, bring my BB gun to school. This is my latest BB gun or air gun, right? And nobody even said or thought anything about it. Just nobody was shooting anybody. So it's a different world, and there are things that you are going to face as a parent that I never had to face. There are situations that I will not be able to give you good advice on and specific stuff that I have not experienced. But at the same time, we have this. We have the Word of God. And the principles that God gives us for raising our children in the Word of God have been around for 6,000 years. And the culture has changed fads will change, societies will change, religions will change. All this stuff is constantly changing, but I'm so thankful that I am the Lord and I change not. And that the principles of God's word are timeless. They're timeless. Biblical principles are transgenerational. They transcend all ages and cultures. So I want to tell you what those are. I want to talk about some biblical principles today that apply to all children of all times, which brings us back to our text. What God was doing here was he had called one and a half million people out of Goshen, out of Egypt, into the promised land, and he is now going to organize them and say God is literally putting a society together. He's putting a country together, his country, his people, and saying, this is the way that I want you to live. These are the principles that I want you to live by. And he begins to give them in stone, in writing to the people, in stone signifying their permanence, signifying their, 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 their permanence. And so uh, that is, first he gives them the Ten Commandments. All right, let's put the Ten Commandments up here. Does anybody remember these? <laughs> we used to speak, we used to learn these in school. Some of you did, right? And now they're taking them out of the schools or try to. 
But let's just look at them. And I, I just want us to look at these because these are the foundational principles upon which we raise our children. Right? Let's say that again. These are the foundational principles upon which we raise our children. All right? Number one, thou shalt have no gods before me. Number two, thou shalt make a, not make unto me any graven images. Okay, that's old. Here's a modern interpretation. One and two mean this. Worship God and make him the only one that you worship, i.e., put God first in your life. That's number one. All right? Number three, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God in vain. Now, that's not just talking about cursing, although some of you need to start right there and stop cursing and stop using God's name because it's a holy name. Stop saying, oh my gee. No, his name is holy. Jesus Christ is not a curse word. He is the son of God. Do not use his name except you are addressing who he is. But it's not just about that. It's about holding sacred the holy things of God. It's about reverence and the fear of God. The next one. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Interpretation, work hard and rest hard. Keep a day separate for God. It's about being dependent upon God and about living a life of balance and moderation. What's the next one? Honor your father and your mother. Honor and respect your parents, your elders, but not just your parents. This is a principle, right? Showing respect and honor to those who are older than us and those who are over us. The next one, what is it? Thou shalt not murder. Don't murder. Don't commit acts of violence. God wants us to be a peaceful people. We need to teach our children that the way to solve issues is not through violence, through peace. Amen? Y'all are really quiet. These are just the Ten Commandments here, okay? Don't be throwing stuff at me. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Here's what it means. Honor your marriage vows and covenant, and God will honor you. Period. Number eight and nine, thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does it mean? Very simply, teach our children, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, live honesty. Uh, honestly, honesty is so important. We need to teach that to our children. And what's the last one? Thou shalt not, what? Covet. What does that mean? Be content with what you have and don't be jealous of what others have. Parents, don't get caught up in the trap of comparing and competing with the Joneses. Amen? So these principles, these Ten Commandments, have, have, have stood the test of time and they will continue until Jesus comes back. And whenever a person, a family, or a society follows these principles, there is order, there is production, and there is security. And whenever we do away with these commands that God gave us and break them, the society will collapse. And then, next, God begins to speak specifically to, par to parents about raising their family. And chapter 6, and we read it. And the first three verses, he gives us a reason why we should be teaching these things to our kids. And the first one is this, to pass the story on, to pass the faith on to the next generation. 
I shared with you in January, this is what God spoke to me as my number one goal as a pastor in this church this year, is to focus on the next generation and preparing them because the next generation very well could be the last generation before the coming of Jesus. And we've got a lot to do. We've got a lot to do. But the second thing is, he said, if you do these things, you will live a healthy and a prosperous life. There is a spiritual aspect, and there is the practical aspect. These commandments that he's giving us are only going to help us in every way. So let's look. He gives in the next few verses four principles on raising children from Deuteronomy 6. And there's others in the Bible. We're just looking at these because these are the primary ones. These are the ones, if you get these right, everything else will be built upon them. And here's the first one. The first one is personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. What are you talking about? The responsibility of raising our children rests upon you as the parents. You say, well, duh, that's a no-brainer, right? No, it's not. I want to tell you something. Everything in our culture has been, has been about taking away the rights of parents for our children. That's the direction that's been going for years now. And I just want to say to those of you who are parents at Lighthouse Church of God, which is most all of you this morning, do not let the government raise your children. It is not their job to raise your kids. It's your job. It's your job that God gave you. And it's the most important job on this earth that you have. There's been a shift, even in education. I've seen it in my, in, during my lifetime. I've seen this shift. You know, when, I was, when, my, when my children were young, I got called into the school once, and they said, the principal said there was a problem with one of my boys. He had did something. You know, he had, anyway, he did something. <laughs> He's probably going to see this. I won't say who it is. He did something, you know, that was, he broke one of the Ten Commandments. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> At school, the principal called me in, and this is what he said. He said, uh, uh, Mr. Lavender, you have a, you have a problem. You know, your son did this. I noticed the language. He said, you have a problem, right? Later on, if your child does something today and they called you in the office, this is what the principal would probably say. We have a problem. Your child did this, and we've got to find a solution to fix his behavior. You notice the shift? The shift is, it used to be the parent's responsibility. Now the school says, your children are our responsibility. Hillary Clinton wrote a book called It Takes a Village. And you know what? I, it's helpful to have a village, to have support, to have teachers and family members and grandparents and uncles and aunts and all these people around us to help us and support us in raising our kids. But it doesn't take a village. Linda and I raised three boys, and we didn't have the help of anybody but each other and God. Even our parents lived thousands of miles, literally, away from us. And you know what? That's what God commanded us. And I'm glad that we have these support systems, but the responsibility of raising our children is yours. You need to get involved. Don't hand the education of your children over to a government who is going against God. God has given you his word and his principles, and if you're going to live by them, live by them, and make sure that everybody that's instilling into your child's life is instilling the values that you want to, them to instill and are influencing your children for who you want to influence them. It's not their job to educate your children, it's your job. It's not their job to discipline your children, it's your job. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little, you know, preachy here, I'm sorry. And my tablet just died. So maybe that's a sign to slow down. But guess what, I have written notes. <laughs> Too bad for you. 
All right, let me find where I am. Give me a second here. Personal responsibility, there we go. All right. Now, I, I hear some of you saying, I hear some of you saying, you know what? Uh, the, well, let's, let's just, uh, some of you are saying, you know what? Uh, my kids, my kids don't want me around. They're teenagers. They don't want my influence. They want to be with their friends at school. They want to be out. They want to be this. They want to be that. They don't want to be around me. And I understand that, right? They're teenagers. They're social peers and social influences. But I want to tell you a secret this morning that I don't want you to buy into the lie. The lie that says that, that you don't influence your kids anymore once they're teenagers. I'm telling you that you are the greatest influence in their life. Period. As parents, you have more clout and influence on your children and their decisions than anybody else. And even though you go to school and you want to pick them up and they're in high school now and they're like, pick me up in the back. They don't want to be seen, you know. First of all, they want to drive their own car. They want to be picked up. And then they don't want to be picked up by the parent, right? And they don't want to be picked up by their parent in, in a 1986 Chevy Caprice, right? I mean, I, 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 can remember, I can remember just wanting so bad the last couple of years to drive up and pick up my son and just get out of the car and have... Uh, have a pair of uh, orange shorts and a bright Hawaiian shirt on with some with some music blaring, you know, from 1980s, and and saying, "Hey, dude, let's go to Surf Up. Come on, Joshua Lavender, Joshua Lavender." <laughs> and he would, you know, I knew he would leave home for sure if I did that. I never see him again. That's the only thing that kept me back because I didn't want him to leave yet. So <laughs> he, had a, he had years to spend. But the truth is, here, here's the thing, see. Uh, and this is the second point. The second thing is model. And it kind of ties in with the first model. But let me say this. You only have your children at home for this season in your life. You don't get a second chance at this parenting thing. You got to make it count. So I tell you, be present with your children. Be present for your children. And there's a difference. Not just be there with them. Not just go to their ball games. Not just be involved with them. But let them know emotionally that they've got you on their team. That you're, the, that you're the biggest cheerleader that they have. That you cannot fail, that they cannot fail in your eyes, even when you are so angry at them. And embarrassed, right? This is the time that you have. Don't. Now I'm getting emotional. Because I don't have kids at home anymore. <laughs> and it happened like that. I can't go back. I can't go back and be there for them and say this to them. I can't. It's done. I've got to move forward. But you have your children. You have your children at home. Be present. Be there with them. And you will discover this, that you will make lots of mistakes as a parent. I promise you, you will make lots of mistakes as a parent. But if your kids know that you're present, if they know that you are for them, if they know that you are right there with them, to have you in, in their court, that you are their cheerleader, if they know those things, that they are loved, that they are affirmed, that there is a home that they can depend on, guess what? A lot of the mistakes you make are going to be forgiven. There's going to be lots of grace there. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Be present for your kids. Second is model. Model. You got to live it first. It's got to be in you if it's going to come out of you. Because the other truth is this. Children do not do what we say. 
They do what we do. Like it or not, you are your child's most influential role model. I want to say to you, you already know this, but I want to say it from the pulpit. Little eyes are watching you. Little feet are following you. Little hands are copying you. You have no bigger assignment in your life. I know you think that your job is you're supposed to take over this company and you're supposed to build this and you're supposed to have this fortune. No, you may be called to do those things, but you have a higher calling on your life. It is the greatest calling of it all, and that is to raise your children in the fear and the admonition of God. This is the biggest investment of your life. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? You have no bigger assignment in your life than right now while you have your children at home. Third thing we see here is he says it's a lifestyle. From the time you get up, how do we teach them? He says from the time they get up in the morning to the time they get in bed. When you're going on the road or when you're in the home, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, he says you're sharing the story. Every moment with your child, he said, is an opportunity to bring God into the story. You're looking for opportunities when you're frying eggs. You know, this egg represents the Trinity. <laughs> Every moment's a teachable moment. You look for them, you seize them, you're open to it because your whole life is a lifestyle. And the most important thing is Jesus, it's a way of life. It's not just a belief system. I love the way he tells parents here, you know, every hour of your waking day. But I hear this a lot from parents that are older. Their kids are not serving God, and they say this to me. You know, I raised my kids in church. I just don't know what happened. You see what's wrong with that? Could it be that you brought your kids from your house to your church, but you didn't bring your church to your house? We must live the lifestyle before them. And with that is the fourth and final thing, and that is answers. It says, be prepared for when your son asks you the question, what's this mark? Why is there this? What is this? That we are to give answers. Parents must provide answers for your children. You know what? If you don't provide an answer for them, I guarantee you somebody else will. And it may not be the answer that you want. And so he says, you got to know it, you got to live it, and you got to give it. That's good, Pastor. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> and, you know, the goal here is to provide a biblical worldview for your children, right? Teach them to view, what does that mean? It means that you teach them to view life through the lens of God's word. That they know who they are. That they are sons and daughters of God and not just Lane and Linda. That they know whose they are, that God owns them and created them. And they didn't come from monkeys. They didn't come from a plasma pool. They were hand created, knit together in their womb by the almighty God. And then he instilled an assignment and gifts and talents and abilities inside of them and that they are here to change the world and that there's nothing they can't do as long as they have Jesus. And everything you do in word or in deed, Colossians 3.17, you do all for the glory of God. That's not about them. Just because. And listen, if you're going to tell your kids it's not about them, you got to make sure it's not about you. This means knowing not just the what, but the why of the questions. How to defend your faith. Apologetics, right? Knowing the answers. Providing answers. Giving arguments for. 
we had two in the last 10 years that I've been here as pastor, we've had, I know, at least two examples of young people who grew up in this church, were taught about the Lord, and they went away to a college, and when they came back from the college, they no longer believed the things in the Word of God. They didn't believe that, they believed it's stories and myths. Jesus never walked on the water to, you know, all these miracles were just, you know, stories to help build people's faith, and it's a good book. You know what the sad thing is? Both of them went to Christian college. I'm telling you, Jesus said in the last days that the spirit of Antichrist is going to deceive people into believing a lie that will damn their souls. That's what we are facing now. So we've got to up our game, parents. We got to up our game, church. We can't just tell our kids, Jesus loves you. You better tell them why he loves them and how he loves them and what it means because we're going to ask some questions, right? And kids ask the hardest questions, don't they? We believe that Jesus heals people, Daddy. Yes, we do. How's come he didn't heal my friend Mikey? He has cancer. How do you answer that? I thought you said God was good, Daddy. God is good all the time, all the time. Then why did he let that bomb blow up all those kids in that hospital? You know, we need to be prepared for the tough answers, right? Because God gives us answers. He gives us truth. And we need to be real, and we need to be transparent, and we need to know it. And you can't show it if you don't know it. You can't share it if you don't have it. So parents... Have devotions together. Read the word of God together. Study the word of God together. Pray with your family together. These are the things that will hold it together. So this is where the church can help you. I want to put this in. This is the role of the church. Five things put up here. And I, I just put the bullet points. I want you to write them down. All right. How can the role, what is the role of the church in helping you with raising your children? Number one, we can provide support and direction to parents so that they can raise godly families. Our job is not to teach your kids about having, about Jesus. That's your job as parents. Our job is to help you to do that. When they come to church, we're going to teach them about Jesus, about having a relationship with Jesus, about the Word of God. We're going to teach them a lot of things. But guess what, parents? We have your kids for one hour a week. One hour a week. And you have them for all hundreds of hours each week. So who has the most influence on their children? You do. People drop their kids off at church and say, okay, I want my kids to know about God, so I drop them off at church. And they hear about God for 45 minutes, 30 minutes of that time, and they go home and they don't hear, they hear about other things all week, and they hear God's name is a curse word. Now, what do you think they're going to turn out? Number two, to reinforce what the parents are teaching their children at home about God and the word. But see, if we're reinforcing what you're teaching at home, but you're not teaching it at home, you're not reading at home, you're not praying with your children at home, you're not talking about God at home, then our job is above and beyond our ability to transform your children. Number three, we are here to give answers to life's questions because God's Questions are all answered in his word. And if you, don't have a, if you don't know the answer to a question, your church should give you the answer to that question. 
And that's the one thing that we are here for. Number four, to provide a community of faith, to foster relationships. You know what? The toughest job in the world is raising children. And the most rewarding job in the world is raising children. But the hardest thing is raising children. And we were not meant to do that on our own. The responsibility of those children is solely upon our shoulders, but God created us for community, and this is a community of faith where we come together and support and help and encourage, and we pray for one another, and we bear one another's burdens, and this way fulfill the law. You need to know you're not alone because where we live in eastern Connecticut in New England, when you say you're a Christian and you're a, and you're 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 Protestant and not Catholic, and that you are evangelical, which means like you're an extremist, right? You are swimming upstream, even the Christian stream. You got other people that that claim to be Christians and they're speaking against you. They don't even believe that in the Bible is the Word of God. They call themselves Christians. They don't live a godly life. They don't even try them to because they got baptized when they were an infant and they took their first communion so they are going to heaven. They don't have to live the life for God. That's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> but we can provide a community where we help one another. We need to do things together as families. You need to be going out to the playground with the other kids of Christian parents. We have a homeschool co-op for homeschoolers that meets on Wednesday. We have a youth group that meets on Friday nights. They go places, they do things, they socialize together. They don't just sit around in a huddle and, and, and read. Uh, they do that too, but there's so much more to it. It's about community, right? It's about us being a family together, and God has called us to carry one another. You have parents who've been there and done that. You've got grandparents. Some of you, your parents live, you know, my, uh, Linda and I, our parents live so far away that we adopted grandparents in the church where we were pastoring to be grandparents for our kids. Those grandparents love that, and we love that too. They got to see what old people were like. <laughs> now I'm a grandparent. And I, by the way, I don't need your kids because I've got my own grandkids. <laughs> Just saying, I got, you know, they're multiplying like rabbits. Can't, can't handle it anymore. My plate is full right now. I love you. I've got some grandparents I'd love to introduce you to. <laughs> to provide a community of faith. Number five, to serve. The church is a place where we can serve. We can use our gifts. We can develop our gifts. I'm closing. Worship team, you'll come up. Or whoever's coming to play for communion, please, we're going to have communion together today. So here's the neat thing about our text, and I, I've been taking way too long with this, and that is this, that God says, if you do these things, I'll do these things. Okay? God says, all these commandments, all these guidelines I'm giving you, they're to help you. They're to bless you. And if you will follow my guidelines, you're going to have a prosperous life. I'm not talking about you're going to be in the top four to 500. I'm not talking about money and gold and cars and things. I'm talking about much more valuable things. I'm going to give you peace. I'm, I'm going to give you joy. Your house is going to be a place of peace and confidence. I'm going to give you boldness. I'm going to give you productivity that everything you do, everything you put your hand to, it's going to prosper. You're going to be productive. You're going to make it you're going to have purpose. You're going to have power. You're going to have passion by following my plan for you. So God says, I'll make a covenant with you. You follow me, and I will follow you. And he said, the psalmist said it like this, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Woo! And then, not only that, but in the next life, he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. In other words, this never ends. It's an everlasting covenant. Later, God would seal that covenant with his own blood if the ushers would come. And that's what this meal represents. The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus.
the blood that was shed for us, the body that was broken for us, was the seal of his covenant. God is saying, I'm doing my part. I've given my life. Now you do yours. I'm not going to break my covenant. Don't break yours. I am the faithful and true God. But here's the deal, right? We're constantly breaking the rules. <laughs> We're constantly failing the covenant. That's what I love about God, is that his grace, his mercy are greater than our sin. That his mercy triumphs over our judgment. And that through the body and blood of Jesus, we can continually find cleansing from our sins. And we don't have to walk in judgment and condemnation. We can walk in freedom and in light and in joy. Stand with me if you would. So this morning, I want to invite you to a meal. I want to invite you to the table of our Lord today. And the requirements for this table are you got to believe in him. You don't have to be a member of this church. You just got to be a member of the family of God. And if you're a member of the family of God and you desire to fellowship with him this morning, I invite you to join in this meal with us today. So I'm going to give you instructions now. And if you're watching online, while we're doing this, will you grab some grape juice and some crackers, bring your family together, sit down at the table, and I'll give you instructions, and you can partake in communion the same time that we are. Why don't you leave what you're doing right now and go get prepared for that if you weren't already. I'm going to ask you to come up and grab one of each of the elements and just hold them in your hands and take them back to your chair. And when everybody has received, then we'll all partake together at the same time. All right? Now I'm going to ask this section to come to your left, and I'm going to ask this section to join them, follow behind them, and go back to your chairs this way, if you would please, at this time, come. Everybody, if you will come to your left, come to this station, this section, come to this station, and return down this aisle. This section, if you will come to your left, and receive from this station right here, this section, come to your left, and then return down this aisle. This section here, if you will come to your left and receive from this station right here, and then go back to your seats down this aisle. This section, if you come at this time to your left and receive here, and return to your seats down that aisle. And we'll wait till everybody's been served. you are waiting, will you just close your eyes and meditate on it? Pray this prayer. Say, Father, if I've committed any sins, I confess my sins to you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I ask for you to wash me and make me clean today. God wants us to come to the table to wash our hands before we come to the table, all right? He wants us to come clean. He wants us to come clean. Just take this moment, Father, just if there's anything in my heart, if there's anything in my life that needs to be dealt with, I just ask that you would just reveal it to me right now, Father. Just show me right, right now. Right now, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your covenant, God. It's an everlasting covenant. It's a covenant of love. It's a covenant of grace of which I can't work my way. I can't buy my way. I can only yield my way. Surrender to you. I do not offer you my money, my means. I offer you my life today, God. Give myself as a living sacrifice to you. This is the this is the worship that you are looking for, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For your goodness, Father. Thank you for your goodness, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
surprise you here. There's a brand new little baby here for the first time today, Sean and Mackenzie, the Mackenzie family. Thank you for your patience. Almost ready. Thank you, Father. Just be in meditation right now. Just close your eyes. Just meditate on Jesus, his love for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This represents the body and the blood of Jesus who gave himself for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us to forgive us of our sins, to restore us back in relationship with the Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Jesus. All right, if you'll raise the bread of our Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul the Apostle gave instructions for this meal, and he says that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus, thank you for submitting to the will of the Godhead and coming, submitting yourself, becoming a man for us. You took on flesh and blood for the whole purpose of it being destroyed. They cut you, they beat you, they bruised you, they punctured you, they murdered you on an ugly cross for us. You took it all for us. You could have called the angels. They could have rescued you from that cross, but you said, no, I am laying down my life as an, as an atoning sacrifice for mankind. And we remember your body, which is broken for us. And we bless this in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may partake. Raise the cup. After supper, he took the cup and he blessed it, saying, This cup is my blood, which is shed you. A new covenant I am making with you. Thank you, Jesus, that you make all things new. Thank you that the new covenant is a covenant that is eternal, everlasting in the heavens, established by you yourself. Thank you, Lord, that it is a free gift to us. If we will we believe and receive it, and today we believe and today we receive, we partake of this, your cup. We bless this cup in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may partake. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Now let's just lift our hands and thank you. Lord, I thank you again. I thank you for the cleansing. I thank you for the fellowship. I thank you for the body of Christ today. I thank you for the table of communion. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have spread a table for us and say, come and dine without money, without price. Let him who is thirsty come. Let him who is hungry come and partake of the waters of the river of life freely. Freely we have received so freely we're able to give. And I pray, God, that as we leave this building and this campus today, that we would take this gift that we have freely received from you, this love, this mercy, this grace, and that we go out of these doors and out of these walls and these halls and out of this parking lot and into these towns all around us, and that we would take Jesus to them. Give Jesus to them, and the love of God would shine through us as the light of the world. And I bless your people today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Love one another. Please join us downstairs for coffee and donuts. We'd love to get to know you. Thank you. There's no leadership meeting tonight. Enjoy your holiday tomorrow. We'll see you next Sunday. Come early if you want to see.